This is the Magna Intelligent Command Demonstrator vehicle. I mean, technically it's a Range Rover Evoque, but this luxury SUV showcases a few intriguing powertrain technologies that have been developed by the multinational supplier company. Up front, we've got a gasoline engine, an electric motor, and a dual clutch transmission. And then at the rear is a whole separate electric drive unit with torque vectoring for better performance. But you know what? Let's see how all of this performs. So this is William Laurie. He is a vehicle systems integration engineer at Magna, and he's going to demonstrate their new intelligent command powertrain system. So that's a lot of words. It sounds complicated. What is it? Yeah, thank you. Our, our intelligent command is our hybrid electric demonstrator vehicle that leverages a couple different technologies mm -hmm. where we see that we can fit within the market to maybe take that next step for the consumer, both customer uh, and you know the end user on the real world drive cycles. Mm -hmm. So we have uh, what we refer to as our dedicated hybrid drive plus. It's a performance oriented version of an electrified transmission. Okay. So we take a single 120 kilowatt motor, pair it with a DCT technology and allow uh, you know, full power shift capability from the DCT functionality in both electric drive and in our hybrid drive paired, mm -hmm. paired with the motor. So up front you've got electric motor, five-speed dual clutch automatic with wet clutches, right? So you've got better shift quality than with dry. Yep. And then there's also gasoline engine, in this case a three-cylinder? Yeah, we pair that right to a three-cylinder gas engine. That mm -hmm. gives us the flexibility of you know operating in both a hybrid mode or in a dedicated EV driving mm -hmm. mode. And all of that is then paired with a electric drive in the rear. So we have okay. a three-in-one EDU system in the back that also has full torque vectoring capability from the two clutches on the outboard of the drivetrain. So you're not using differential braking to apportion that torque left to right. That's a dedicated clutch pack a more efficient design, really. Yeah, there's there's two clutch backs that allow us to transfer uh, up to the full amount of torque to the left wheel or to the right wheel, depending on any driving scenario that mm -hmm. we're in, both low mu and high mu. Gotcha. And then that rear axle is also, it disconnects when you don't need it, right? So you can, you can have efficiency improvements as well. Yeah, you can open up those clutch packs and essentially transfer no torque to the wheels if uh -huh. you really need it. So, um, you know, saving on efficiency, using less of your electrical energy mm -hmm. is, is something that we see as a real world scenario that we want to make sure that we can leverage within our technologies. Mm -hmm. And between these two powertrains, what is the total system output? It's like 400 and something kilowatts. Yeah, we have 120 kilowatts from the front end motor, 160 kilowatts from the rear, and then the engine where needed is about 147 kilowatts additional. Okay. So, so that fills in when you need it. I mean, ideally, yeah. if this is a plug-in hybrid powertrain, you're going to be plugging it in yeah. and hopefully running it mostly on electricity. Yeah, with our system, we want to maximize the or extend the EV driving yeah. capability of the vehicle so we can really go 110 kilometers um, of pure EV driving range where we don't even need the engine because of the way the system is set up mm -hmm. and the way it's sized. We're going to offer full functionality in EV mode mm -hmm. or full functionality in hybrid mode. And, you know, it's really up to the customer and the use case of how they're driving it mm -hmm. to determine which way that's going to happen. Because this will work, this technology works with a plug-in if you want to have a larger battery. We have, what, a 21 and a half kilowatt hour pack here? Yeah, that's correct. All the systems are powered by that battery that we're, yeah. you know, continuously charging and, uh, you know, recharging, whether it's through regen or whether it's through the engine as well. So if an OEM wants to implement this technology, integrate it into a vehicle with a plug-in drivetrain, they can. Or if they don't want to have the expense of that larger battery, they can use it with just a conventional hybrid, too. Yeah, they could do something similar. Yeah. Um, you know, this, the way that this vehicle is laid out, it's scaled more towards a performance aspect. Mm. But because of both drives are scalable up and down, mm -hmm. we have that flexibility to meet different platform needs. Sounds good. Well, you just mentioned performance. Why don't you show me what this thing can do? I'm curious. Yeah, let's go for a drive. We'll start off with our, our traditional, you know, all-wheel drive hybrid mode. Mm -hmm. What this does is it allows the vehicle to really optimize and select what gear we're in for that transmission in the front, okay. as well as what the power balance is between front to rear. So uh, during this moderate acceleration here, mm -hmm. we're going to stay mostly in our electric driving mode. Mm -hmm. um, that's going to, you know, decrease the emissions that you're going to see from an engine because you're not really operating it right now. Mm -hmm. um, but when I ask for more power, for yeah. for more torque from the system because that was pretty brisk acceleration but you didn't yeah. have to hear the engine turn on so. yeah we didn't have engine turn on yet but what we're going to do is we're going to see this seamless uh, engine turn on when i start to tip in here oh yeah and ask for an acceleration you know all right that that, that is properly quick <laughs> in, in the back of the corporate parking lot too don't tell security <laughs> yeah we'll stay back here to keep away from everybody else um but uh 
you know, the transmission that we have created for this concept, we talked a little bit about the DCT functionality, mm -hmm. right? And that's leveraged from some of our production products mm -hmm. already today. But it allows us to do seamless upshifts and downshifts mm -hmm. with both the EM and the engine, and maybe a combination of the both. Uh -huh. So we can drive the electric motor and the engine through the same gear, similar to what we were just doing there. Yeah. Or as I speed up in, in you know, and ask for additional torque, we can shift between different gears, so maybe second to third or third okay. to fourth. Seamless transition, so no change to torque to the wheels, mm -hmm. imperceptible to the driver, yeah, but allowing us to have you know continuous uh, increase in vehicle speed mm -hmm. and a constant delivery of power. So you've got the combustion engine, you've got the electric motor, they're working together to power the vehicle, Correct. at least in the front drive unit. Yep. Um, how are you, what, what is the handshake between those? Is it a planetary gear set? Is it somehow working through the dual clutch system? Or is that only on the final drive side? H how are those two working together? What's the interface? Yeah, great question. Um, we have a disconnect between the engine and the transmission mm -hmm. that allows us to physically decouple the engine to mm -hmm. reduce our losses and sure. not have to spin anything there. But when coupled together, the engine would then be able to pass through that DCT in either the 2-4 gear set or the one three, five gear set, depending on when the clutches are, or which clutch is closed in that scenario. Mm -hmm. uh, the electric motor itself is paired to the 2-4 gear set, so we would always drive through that region unless okay. we decide to send power back around through the DCT okay. to go through that 3-5 so gear pretty, set. So it would direct drive through 2 or 4, because those are on the same shaft? Yeah. That's correct. It gets very confusing. And that allows us essentially to have enough torque to launch in second gear. Uh -huh. But if we need to hit a max vehicle speed or a highway you know, cruising speed, uh -huh. we can actually shift into third gear with that power shift functionality we okay. talked about. And then even back into fourth gear, depending on the use case of the actual vehicle. So just so I'm clear, that motor is driving the two four gear shaft. And that would power the vehicle directly in second gear or fourth gear. But Correct. if you want, if you were in first gear or fifth gear, it would have to route through the transmission then to do that. Or what, I'm missing the connection there. Yeah, we kind and of maybe that's too complicated <laughs> for for a general audience. But I'm very curious. Yeah. So the the way that the transmission is created is that there's a single shift shift mechanism mm -hmm. for the two four gear path. Okay. And then there's another shift mechanism for the one three five gear path. Okay. And so depending on which clutch is closed from the DCT, mm -hmm. if they're both open, we'll drive through the two four path. Okay. And then if both of these clutches are closed, we can actually drive through the oh, one three okay. five gear path. And this has the ability to go to neutral. So you're driving through both clutches then to we get can. through one, three, or five. Absolutely, okay. we can. Yeah. That, the, the little diagram on the screen here actually makes a lot of sense then when you mention that. Okay, so that's the front powertrain of this vehicle, William. Mm -hmm. What's going on at the back? That's just an electric motor and some clutches, right? Yeah, that's correct. Um, so we have a 160 kilowatt e-motor in mm -hmm. the rear, um, driven by our platform inverter strategy. Um, that drives through a gear set and then therefore to two clutches. Um, and with those clutches, what we can do is we can proportionate torque to the left wheel or to the right wheel or to a combination mm -hmm. you know, of both of them. And that gives us the dynamic ability to affect the oversteer and understeer behavior of the car mm -hmm. in any driving scenario and on any, any surface. Gotcha. So you've got clutch packs, torque left or right as needed based on driving conditions or driver inputs and demands. If you're out on the, the mountain road on a Saturday or something. Yeah. You can have a bit more fun, but also that whole rear axle assembly will disconnect if necessary. You're commuting to work, you want to get the most miles out of the battery pack, yes. you can do that as well. Absolutely. We can open those clutches right up and therefore you don't have to transfer any torque to, to either one of those wheels. Very nice. Uh, so would an OEM integrate both of these powertrains into the same vehicle? Obviously that's what you've done here. Is that what you envision as the production version of this technology? or? Would it be sort of separate systems? For a performance-oriented aspect, this is the perfect setup. Mm -hmm. right? You get the benefit of both worlds mm -hmm. in EV and in hybrid mode. If we're talking about um, maybe a simple conventional system that they want to hybridize at this mm -hmm. point, you could go either route. You could de, you know, depair these two devices and you could offer just a hybrid transmission mm -hmm. with their conventional engine. Or if they wanted to keep their conventional engine, we could add this you know, P4 technology to the rear and its own battery pack and allow for all-wheel drive functionality on top of the hybrid function. Gotcha. So OEMs have a great a range of options to choose from. Yeah, we've made it customizable to show multiple different use cases across a ton of different platforms mm -hmm. and how it can benefit both the customer 
um, you know, that we interact with every day and the customer that's going to buy it and drive it down the road. Yeah. Uh, is it easy for OEMs to package these systems in their vehicles? Because that's always the big issue. You've got other systems in a car, in a platform that you have to work around. Yeah. That maybe a vehicle was designed for a conventional ice, you know, maybe an inline four, longitudinally mounted, and it might be difficult if mm -hmm. this is designed for a transverse application. But what is the size of these drive units and are they easy enough to package in a vehicle? Yeah, with most of our applications and technology that we develop today, we're always looking at how to combine and condense all of the technology into one application. Mm -hmm. So the transmission, for example, was able to, we were able to add an electric motor mm -hmm. and maybe reduce a gear set or two from the DCT side of things, mm -hmm. but package it in roughly the same amount of space. Mm -hmm. Actually, no increase, and that's important for a yeah. transversal engine. Um, but you think about other, you know, actuators and inverters and, uh, you know, the additional components that you have to package. And mm -hmm. we pride ourselves on being able to fit those in, uh, those instruments into a condensed space mm -hmm. so that it leverages the OEM's ability to allow them to package their additional mm -hmm. systems around it. When we talk about the rear drive itself, it's also customizable and configurable in terms of you can decouple the inverter if you need to, to mm -hmm. keep it separate if there's a better packaging environment. But in this case, it's all kind of condensed into one, kept with a low floor pan to mm -hmm. make sure that you still have the trunk space in the rear of the vehicle. You've got a five-speed transmission in this. And we live in a world where seven, eight, nine, ten gears is the norm, mm -hmm. at least with a traditional combustion engine. Is five gears enough in this application? Yeah, due to the scaling and the size of the e-motor that's currently in this transmission, mm -hmm. um, we've been able to remove those gears those additional gears, maybe mm -hmm. six and seven from your hybrid transmission application, because we have the electric motor that can propel the vehicle yeah. to max vehicle speed and maybe gear three or gear four. And we don't really need to go too much higher than that unless there's a efficient need or a, a reason to select that gear. Mm -hmm. But we also have it, you know, gears one or two to maybe do an e-launch maneuver okay. or to propel the vehicle from a stop. And it still drives very much like a BEV, even with those you know, reduced number of gears yeah. because of the higher speed that your EM is spinning at and the additional torque capacity. Definitely, so. and, you, and you don't need that many steps up the staircase, that many gears with electric because the power band, the torque is so much broader than in a combustion engine. Correct, yeah, and that's, it goes partly into how we select the gear ratios for that, those, those five gears they mm -hmm. become. Uh, important to make sure that we provide low end torque, but mm -hmm. also efficiency at highway cruising speeds. So, so is the Intelligent Command system in production today? And if so, where could customers buy it? The configuration that we see today is not in production. While we do leverage components from our, our production families, mm -hmm. the DCTs, um, some of the shifting strategies, the clutches for the torque vectoring, for example. Yeah. Um, so we have the, the background and the knowledge to say that some of the components are in production, but we reconfigure it to maybe show a different application of how you can hybridize a vehicle today um, and then the benefits of those systems that we already produce. Mm -hmm. So not in production yet, but potentially pretty close then, right? If a yeah. lot of this is stuff that you guys are already building. Yeah, absolutely. Both of these products have gone through rigorous testing, development cycles to make sure that we're as robust as possible. And at this point, you know, could could be ready for production any day now. Oh, gotcha. So if, if you're an OEM, reach out to Magna today for the Intelligent Command powertrain. I'm not, I'm not going to get a commission, unfortunately, but... <laughs> <laughs> With the different drive modes, what we've uh, enabled is the ability to allow the torque vectoring system to do more and more and the brake system to do less and less. Mm -hmm. And so we talk about safety systems and vehicles today and there's no way around it. But in some applications, you are allowed, the OEM allows you to turn off your safety systems okay. or minimize them in a way. Uh -huh. And that's where we want to make sure we're maximizing the effort of the powertrain to do exactly what the customer is doing. So when we talk about torque vectoring and in a turn, we want the vehicle, we expect the vehicle to go in the direction that I'm turning the steering wheel. Right, and we expect it to be generally that's what you want, right? <laughs> predictable and drivable. Yeah, we don't want to. We don't want too much oversteer. We don't want too much understeer. Right. So keeping the vehicle planted and in a, an environment that's stable and comfortable for the driver is, is always what it's about. Mm -hmm. So let's do a tight turn. Here. So we're turning here. <laughs> Oh yeah, you can definitely feel the back end. Allow a little bit of rotation yeah. without going too far, you know? Controlled. I'm, I'm sure the stability system is still on in some capacity. We it can, feels yeah. like we've got some ABS yeah, so, action going. But... So what we'll do next is turn that off. Okay. And we can actually do an, an example, same thing without you know too much intervention from the braking system here. Okay, so, so this is more of a hands-off. Yes, correct. Demo. 
Oh yeah. So, you know, if I tip out, we kind of go tighter oh, in a yeah. circle. Look at that. And then when I tip in, we may just, you know, start to let the rear step out a little bit and keep the vehicle planted right in the direction of the steering wheel. So very nice. So if you want to get sideways on your commute to work, <laughs> you've got that option. I won't publicly condone that, but I'm in full support. <laughs> awesome. Well, William, thank you so much for the demonstration here. Uh, fascinating technology, and it seems to work pretty damn well. Yeah, we're, we're very proud of the refinement of this vehicle um, and where we've been able to take the technology. We're ready to see it go that next step um, and drive on the roads next to you on your commute every day. Look forward to it. Next up, do you know what an LFP battery is? Well, if not, click right over here to check out this great episode of EV Basics where I explain what this technology is as well as its benefits and disadvantages.